All right, well, thank you everyone for coming today. Carrie Bracca, speech and language pathologist, is gonna be talking today, talking with us today about dysphagia. Thank you so much, Carrie, for coming. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. So share with us. All right, so my name is Carrie. Um, I am a speech therapist. Um, I currently work in a skilled nursing facility as the director of rehab. Um, but I also serve as a speech therapist in the building. So I've been practicing for almost 10 years. Um, I don't know how familiar you guys are with skilled nursing facilities, but we're essentially transitional care homes. So for patients that are not quite ready to go home, but they're not ill enough to require the hospital, come to us. Um, we provide physical therapy, occupational therapy, and speech therapy in the facility. And like I said, I also serve as a speech therapist. Um, I've been practicing for almost 10 years, but I've been the manager in this building for almost six. Um, and it's pretty much the only environment that I've ever worked in. I do do a little bit of home health therapy, um, but primarily most of my experience has been in a skilled nursing facility or a SNF. Um, I see a lot of stroke patients. I do a lot of dysphagia therapy. I would say that that's probably my primary um, focus, I, although I do do cognition and aphasia. Um, so I'm going to talk to you guys today about dysphagia. Um, we're going to start kind of at the beginning and just kind of go over the anatomy and physiology a little bit and then kind of get into how the brain works with the swallowing mechanism and then talk about some treatment um, signs and symptoms that you're going to see and things like that. So we're go ahead and get started. Um, our first slide here is just the structure of the larynx. Um, so what you're going to see here, do you guys see my mouth? Like scrolling over the stuff? Yes, we can okay. see. All right, so you've got your thyroid cartilage, your hyoid bone here, and then your cricoid cartilage, the tracheal rings down here. And then looking from a mid-sagittal view, you're looking at the tongue here, your epiglottis, this is called the vollecula space here, um, soft palate, hard palate, the teeth and the lips, your, um, your larynx is here and it's composed of the vocal folds and then the cartilages that we just spoke about. Um, so this is your airway here and then your esophagus here in the back. Um, and then this is just kind of a view looking from the top to the bottom. So you're looking at the vocal folds here and the trachea here, your tongue, and then your esophagus here. What's interesting about the esophagus when you're looking at it from this view um, is you don't actually really see like the opening for it. So your trachea, your airway essentially is pretty prominent, it's obvious, but the esophagus doesn't have like a big opening for you to see. Um, and it's closed um, until food comes down into the, lar the laryngeal vestibule, if you will. Um, and it's closed by um, an upper esophageal sphincter, which is just a band of muscles that keeps it tightly closed. It's also good um, to prevent um, like backflow from your stomach as well. All right, so this video I'm hoping will pull up. Um, it just kind of gives you, a, it's very quick, um, just a visualization of how everything works in motion while you're swallowing. I'm gonna see if I can get it to play here. And there's really no like audio to it. So um, you can just like this white part is the bolus. So you're just looking at how it goes down and obviously for a normal swallow. Um, and if you watch your epiglottis folds down and serves kind of as a slide to divert the food away from your airway and into your esophagus, which is back here. And here they're just forming the bolus from the tongue, the hard palate, the soft palate also plays into effect. And then it slides down, epiglottis diverts it and brings it down into your esophagus. And that's it really. So quick, it happens very quickly. Um, one thing to consider though, is that if any of these um, structures are out of whack, 
it could impact everything from the oral phase of the swallow to the pharyngeal phase of the swallow to the esophageal phase and including the stomach. Like if you're having digestive issues, you can also see issues with your swallowing as well. It's all one big system. Let's see here. I want to go to my next slide, so we're actually moving. I might have to escape out of this and change it because I'm not sure why it won't. There we go. Okay. So normal control of the swallowing mechanism requires functioning of the brainstem. This is where your swallowing uh, is housed, essentially. Um, obviously, there's other portions of the brain that control it as well or play a role into it. But if you're um, if you have a stroke in the brainstem, you can automatically assume that somebody's going to end up with some type of dysphagia. Um, so let's see. Um, there are over 30 muscles involved in swallowing and are coordinated by a complex neural network that's not completely understood. Um, stuff that I've learned 10 years ago when I was in grad school has changed a lot in the way that we treat things. Um, you know, so it's important to really stay up on current things because as we continue to learn more about the body and the brain, obviously our role in treating dysphagia and things like that is gonna change as well. Um, so some cranial nerves that are directly um, involved in swallowing include the glossopharyngeal nerve, and then the vagus nerve, which is a big one, it controls muscles in the pharynx, soft palate, and the larynx. So swallowing is broken down into four stages. Um, there's the oral phase, which essentially has two stages, the pharyngeal phase, and then the esophageal phase. As a speech therapist, the esophageal phase um, isn't something that is as easily accessible for us. Um, so a lot of times if we see people with esophageal dysfunctions, we have to refer them out to a GI specialist or an ENT to kind of get a better idea of like what's going on. Um, there aren't a lot of like compensatory strategies or treatment approaches from a speech therapist point of view that can really treat that. Um, but the oral phase, so it includes the oral preparatory phase and the oral transit. So the oral preparatory phase really starts when you're bringing the food to your mouth and then the deglutition, so the chewing of the food and preparing it into a cohesive bolus, manipulating it and um, starting to bring it back to the back of the mouth, which is the oral transit. These are all voluntary processes. Um, and then it starts the pharyngeal phase, which is where the bolus is propelled into the esophagus. Um, it is thought that the pharyngeal phase or the involuntary phase of swallowing starts at the anterior fascial pillars, which is when you open your mouth, you see your uvula hanging down in the back of your throat. You see two little pillars on each side of your throat. It's the very first pillar. So it's thought that when the bolus reaches that point, everything else is involuntary and kind of um, the airway proceeds to protect itself from the bolus. Um, and then the esophageal phase is also involuntary um, and that's where the bolus is carried into the stomach through a process of um, esophageal peristalsis which is just pulsing of the um, esophagus to help pull the food down. All right, so what is dysphagia? Um, it, it's defined by ASHA, which is the American Speech, Language, and Hearing Association, by difficulty or pain caused by swallowing in which there is a disruption in the ability to effectively move a bolus from the oral cavity to the stomach. Dysphagia can be caused by a number of things, um, but stroke, however, is the biggest contributor, um, especially in the elderly. Other contributors can be medication. So a lot of times medications, their side effects can cause dysphagia. Weakness or degeneration, so just overall debility. Um, neuromuscular diseases such as Parkinson's, that's a big one, um, ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease. Um, and then sometimes uh, diagnoses such as COPD, CHF, so uh, congestive heart failure, um, those are conditions that can disrupt the respiratory system, which also plays a role in your swallowing function. 
All right, so dysphagia affects more than 50% of stroke survivors, um, but only 11 to 13% of those stroke victims continue with dysphagia after six months. Um, so sometimes um, you'll see it, uh, dysphagia right after a stroke, and then a lot of times, just as time goes on, that swallowing mechanism that may have been disrupted kind of will fix itself sometimes without therapy, but most of the time um, will require therapy. One study reported that 8% of patients with prolonged dysphagia required alternative means of nutrition, like a feeding tube. Um, and some other things to consider following a stroke and how they may uh, contribute to and affect management of dysphagia are what other systems are being impacted um, with the stroke. So if somebody has had a stroke on the left side of the brain where the language center is housed, they're going to have difficulty comprehending the instructions that you're giving them for compensatory strategies and things like that. Um, and then for a cognitive impairment, um, it may affect management of dysphagia because they are having trouble with um, monitoring themselves, they're impulsive, and they may not remember to use the strategies when they're not being cued for them. So some signs of dysphagia that you might see with the oral phase of swallowing um, include anterior substance loss caused by poor labial seal or poor or oral control. So the food is falling out of the front of their mouth. Um, they're having difficulty chewing, um, whether it's caused by weakness or they're just continuously chewing. So they're perseverantly chewing, um, maybe because of decreased sensation, because of weakness on one side. Um, or bolus formation, so they don't have the coordination with their tongue to move it effectively to help uh, form that cohesive bolus. Um, with that, you're also going to see difficulty moving the bolus um, to the back of the throat. Um, a delayed swallow trigger, so sometimes the patient may need a lot of cues to swallow. Um, one strategy that has been helpful for me in the past is like actually like massaging their throat to encourage them to actually trigger that swallow and to get the bolus out of their mouth. Um, pocketing or holding the bolus in their cheeks. Um, it can be under their tongue sometimes or after they swallow, they may have a lot of residue on their tongue or in their cheeks because of just decreased sensation, decreased ability to form that bolus. Um, things like that. All right, so pharyngeal phase, um, you know, sometimes you're going to see these when a patient isn't aspirating, um, and sometimes you're not going to see them. So silent aspiration is a big problem. 70% um, of patients with dysphagia do silently aspirate. Um, so it's one thing to kind of think about when you're doing your treatment with these patients. Um, you can't see what's going on in their throat. So you can make an educated guess about what's going on, but um, sometimes if you have access to an instrumental like a, a FEES, a fiber optic endoscopic evaluation of the swallow or a modified barium swallow study, it's if you have access to that kind of stuff, um, it would be useful for you to use them because sometimes it's easier to treat a problem when you know exactly why they're aspirating or having trouble. Um, so some signs and symptoms of aspiration, coughing, choking, um, which there's obviously a difference between coughing and choking. Choking, they're not making, moving any air, they're not making any noise, their faces are turning red. Um, coughing is a good thing. That is our body's normal reaction to eject something from our airway. So we want that. We want to remove it. And so if a patient is coughing, let them cough it out. Um, sometimes if like our reflex sometimes is to smack them on the back. You don't always want to do that because it may lodge it in their throat. Um, so if they're managing by coughing, let them do that. Um, runny nose, sometimes that can be an indicator. Sometimes it could be spicy food. Um, so, so you just kind of got to take these with a grain of salt and look at the, big, um, the bigger picture with these. Um, watery eyes, hydrophonia, so a wet or gurgly vocal quality after they're swallowing. Um, I actually have a patient right now that has suffered a pretty massive stroke. She had one that affected her um, left side of her body initially and then 
just recently had another one that affected her right side. So she's pretty incapable of moving her body at this point, except for her head. Um, and she, I, one way I've been monitoring her aspiration is through um, wet vocal quality, because she does tend to sound really gurgly if she's had trouble swallowing um, a certain consistency, but if she's managing it okay, she sounds dry. Um, so complaints upon um, swallowing or complaints of pain upon swallowing can be a sign of aspiration or difficulty swallowing. Globus sensation, so the feeling of something getting stuck in your throat. Um, a lot of times I'll ask a patient where they're having that sensation because if it's above the level of your vocal fold, so above the thyroid, generally it's an issue that we can manage. But a lot of times, if it's below, it can signal um, like an esophageal issue. So some things that you cannot confirm without having um, an instrumental assessment, like the modified or the fees, is a delay. Um, so a delay in the um, esophageal opening, a delay in the protection of the larynx, hyaluryngeal excursion, so in the past, when I was in school, we used to say, okay, well, if your um, thyroid essentially moves up and forward, you've got good movement, but we've kind of ruled that out. You cannot visualize that anymore. Um, any residue in the pharynx um, and then silent aspiration. All right, so some symptoms that you'll see with a esophageal dysphagia, weight loss, the globus sensation again, GI discomfort, um, heartburn, regurgitation, belching, respiratory problems, um, and then difficulties with swallow or swallowing solids and pills can be the biggest red flag of an esophageal um, dysfunction. All right, so again, normal swallowing requires function and coordination of the mouth, pharynx, and esophagus. If one becomes functionally impaired, the others may also be affected. And assessment of all swallowing phases may improve diagnosis and therapy in patients with non-obstructive dysphagia. So something like an osteophyte, which is where your vertebrae is calcifying and essentially growing into your airway, um, something like that, we're not gonna have a lot of effective treatment approaches for it because unless that's removed, the problem is gonna remain. All right, so screening for dysphagia. Um, most of our patients that come into our facility, um, you know, if they're coming in on a regular diet, they don't have any history of swallowing issues. I can kind of just peek in on them during a meal to make sure that there are no um, issues that have gone unnoticed. But a screen for us is a hands-off observation of a patient during a meal. Um, but it kind of gives you insight onto whether or not they're gonna need further assessment. Um, so our diagnostic evaluation of dysphagia, um, the clinical bedside um, swallowing evaluation is the one that we use the most here um, and is probably gonna be the one you guys use the most as well, especially without access to um, like an instrumental assessment. All right, so what you're looking for in a bedside swallowing evaluation, um, if a patient again warrants instrumental assessment, you can identify them during the bedside. And then you're gonna develop a hypothesis of the pathophysiology of the swallowing dysfunction as to why they're having dysphagia. Um, you're gonna be looking at some trial interventions to test and then develop ideas regarding management or treatment of dysphagia. All right, so the first things that you're gonna wanna do when you're doing your bedside um, swallow evaluation is a chart review. So you're looking at the reason they're maybe being referred to you um, or what the biggest complaint is, any of their medical or surgical history, um, imaging and lab results, sometimes abnormal lab findings may be indicative of aspiration. 
you're looking at nursing documentation or any other type of documentation that comes along with the patient, what their current diet is. Um, I always like to touch base with the families um, to get a history of whether or not they've had swallowing problems. Um, sometimes that stuff's not documented in their chart. You wanna ask the family, you know, have they been coughing like this for a long time? That might be normal for them. Sometimes people just cough throughout a meal. I've had a patient in the past that literally coughed the entire meal on anything and everything we presented to her. And I'm thinking, oh, she's aspirating everything. Like, this is a problem. We ended up doing an instrumental on her. We did a fees on her, and she wasn't aspirating anything, nothing. You know, so it's good to kind of talk to the family and see, like, is this normal for the patient or not? Um, sometimes people don't realize that they've had dysphagia for years and years. Um, you know, if they've had any type of head CT or MRI, obviously that's going to um, play a big part in your treatment. And then a chest x-ray. Um, it used to, the theory used to be that, you know, if they have aspiration in the left lower lobe, it's more indicative of aspiration, but that has also been ruled out. Um, either lung base or suspicious for aspiration. So um, continuing on after you've done your chart review and kind of developed um, a good history of the patient, we're looking at their oral motor mechanism. So are they able to move their mouth? Are they able to move their tongue appropriately? Um, how is their oral hygiene? Um, we tend to get a lot of patients that have thrush, which is um, a yeast infection on their tongue, especially if they're um, on a feeding tube. Um, you think, oh, well, they're not eating and drinking. They don't need good oral care. That's not the case. They need it more aggressively when they're not eating and drinking because the food and the drink isn't actively washing away bacteria and food in our mouth. Um, you know, so that's definitely something that you want to keep in mind. Um, and then obviously you're looking at their dentition. Um, that could or could not play a role on what type of food consistency they can handle. Um, I've seen people without teeth um, eat a piece of steak without any trouble, you know, so you certainly want to, again, get a history on what the patient was eating prior to. Um, and then you're looking at their coughing ability. Are they able to produce a cough voluntarily? Because if not, they may have trouble producing one when they need to, to protect their airway. Um, and then sometimes too, that can indicate um, whether or not they have weakness in their vocal folds. Um, patients that generally have strokes in the brainstem will generally have paralysis in one or both of the, um, your vocal folds. And that's really important if they're paralyzed closed because then you're not breathing. Um, so that is, could definitely be a serious issue. And then obviously decreased sensation is going to be um, a big problem too. So then you also want to look for dysarthria when you're doing this. Are you looking, do they have weakness in their mouth and why? Is it because of the stroke and is it just weakness? Um, because that's going to be a little bit easier to manage as opposed to somebody that has apraxia. Um, Apraxia is difficulty coordinating your articulators um, in order to perform speech. So um, dysarthria, they're having trouble moving their tongue, their lips because of weakness, whereas apraxia is difficulty with coordination and placing your tongue essentially in the right position um, to produce a particular sound. And that's um, caused by damage to the motor strip in the brain. So again, going back to the cognitive linguistic abilities, if the stroke has affected the right side of their brain, you may see difficulties with orientation, um, behaviors, so they're gonna be easily distract, distracted, impulsive, be talking a lot while they're eating. Um, and then you're looking at comprehension and expression again, um, and the patient's ability to follow commands and participate in further assessment or treatment. Um, and again, are they going to be able to remember the strategies that are being implemented?
Okay, so again, you want to consider a case holistically. So you want to look at all components in regards to um, treatment and assessing a patient. Um, you don't necessarily have to trial all consistencies when you're assessing somebody. Um, sometimes we'll get patients that are on a modified diet coming to us, um, like a soft diet, because maybe they just weren't completely alert in the hospital, but when they get to us and kind of get established, they're more awake and they want to get back to eating those regular things. Um, so if I've got somebody that's pretty high level cognitively, is able to follow directions, is carrying on conversations with me, and has a good memory, things like that, like I'm probably just going to go ahead and give them something regular to try to see how they manage it. But if I have somebody coming to me that's significantly impaired um, and just obviously not going to be able to handle presentations and I'm going to start at my lowest level. So your thickest liquid consistency is honey. It's essentially like honey. Um, and then nectar is going to be a little bit thinner than that, like the consistency of syrup. And then your thin liquids, which is, you know, stuff that you and I drink. Um, and then for solids, you're looking at puree. That's going to be your most restrictive. And then mechanical soft and then regular solid food. Um, one thing that I am a big advocate for is the Fraser Free Water Protocol. Um, it's the theory that our bodies are made up primarily of water. So if we're going to aspirate something, water is the safest thing to aspirate. Um, the caveat to that, though, is we want to be doing really aggressive oral care with patients because any food particles or bacteria that's in the patient's mouth um, that may get aspirated with the water, that's going to pose the biggest issue um, and potentially cause pneumonia and infections in patients. Um, so certainly good oral hygiene and then water. So the patient that I was talking to you guys about earlier that I currently have on caseload, um, I've been just essentially doing water trials with her until the last couple of days because that is going to be her lowest risk of um, negative uh, side effects, if you will. If you guys hear um, somebody in the background, my little boy is upstairs <laughs> resting, so I promise I'm not like hiding somebody up there. <laughs> No worries. You guys can interrupt Carrie at any time to, to ask questions. I have put everyone on mute, so you'll just have to unmute yourself if you want to ask a question. Yeah, please interrupt me. I certainly don't mind um, asking questions or answering questions, excuse me. Okay, so things to consider when you're getting ready to present patients um, with boluses, so whether it be food or liquids, is the patient alert? Number one thing, never ever give a patient that is not alert any type of bolus. It's really just not appropriate, but it's also not safe for the patient. You really wanna wait until they're a little bit more alert um, and have a little bit more acknowledgement of what's going on so that they can give you their best effort in swallowing. Um, so generally, again, I usually just start with water um, especially if there's somebody that's pretty debilitated, I just want to see how they're going to handle that. Um, and they're less likely, again, to have any additional problems from the water. So teaspoon trials are, you know, a small, easy initial um, trial to give them. If you think that they're going to have uh, issues with impulsivity or difficulty holding the bolus in any capacity, um, it's a good place to start and you get to control it. So you get to control the speed at which they're taking it, but also the presentation and the size of it. You then wanna maybe trial um, cup sips. Um, look at both single and successive swallows um, with the cup. If they're pretty cognizant, can hold the cup themselves, give them the cup and see how they do. Um, the reason you want to do successive too is because generally people, when we're thirsty, we're not going to just take one sip, especially if we're very parched, we're going to 
drink it down, we're gonna gulp it. So you wanna see kind of how they drink naturally for themselves. Uh, and that is also called the Yale Swallow Assessment. The theory behind that is that if they can tolerate successive swallows in a three ounce quantity, they're less likely to have dysphagia. Straw trials would be the next place that you would try or the um, next section that you would try. Um, the one thing to consider with straws is that they are placed further back in your throat. So your um, larynx doesn't have as much time to protect itself. Um, so that's going to be kind of the hardest thing for somebody to manage, especially too if they have um, difficulties with the oral phase. Like they may not be able to put their lips around the straw effectively to pull it through um, and get it into their mouth. And then you're also risking premature spillage. So it pouring down into their larynx before they're actually triggering the swallow. If they're having trouble with the straw, but they're not having trouble with the cup, then just remove the straw and let them have the cup. Um, you know, Sometimes cups can be harder to manage, again, if they're having um, weakness and issues with the oral phase. Um, but again, case by case management, you want to be able to give the patient what they can handle. Um, ice chips, um, you want to kind of consider the oral control um, with the ice chip because certainly you don't want that ice chip sliding back into their throat. Um, but the good thing is, is it's going to melt. Um, so you don't have as big of a concern with that. Um, but it's also a good therapeutic activity to help increase oral control by giving them ice chips to suck on. And again, with the Fraser Free Water Protocol, um, you're less likely to have complications from aspirating water in the ice chips as opposed to anything else. Um, thicker isn't always better. You know, there are risks with thickened liquids, um, you know, you're more likely to get pneumonia or some type of infection from aspirating thickened liquids than you are from water. Um, and then patients just don't generally care for thickened liquids because they're not going to quench your thirst. Um, so they're less likely to drink them and become dehydrated quicker on um, thickened liquids. Right, so if a patient is unable to tolerate thin liquids in any capacity, then you can try nectar thick liquids. So my patient that I have um, that's on the peg, I just started trialing her with nectar yesterday. I started with the thin. Um, she is obviously aspirating the thin liquids. Um, and so I wanted to wait to kind of give her some time to actually be able to rehab her swallow before trialing anything else and she appears to be tolerating the nectar okay. Um, so honestly, if she continues to do okay with that for the next couple of days, I might actually initiate um, nectar thick and then the Fraser free water protocol with her. So do, having water in between um, with a clean mouth. Um, again, you can start with a teaspoon trials if necessary when you're looking um, at the assessment. Um, and then move on to cup and straw trials. A lot of patients won't drink thickened liquids um, from a straw. It's just harder to manage. Um, I mean, it's like drinking a milkshake essentially out of a straw. Um, it's hard to sometimes um, manage it, especially when you've already got weakness and some other things going on. Um, so I don't always um, trial straws with thickened liquids. Um, again, just because the majority of people that are drinking thick and liquids don't really care for the straw. Um, but it is a good exercise to give people as well because it does that resistance that the thick and liquids creates um, is a good exercise for increasing labial seal, increasing tone in um, your cheek muscles, things like that. Um, again, there is a risk for dehydration associated with thick and liquids. Um, and thicker isn't always better. So you just wanna make a good clinical judgment as to why you're putting the patient on the thickened liquids, do they need it, and is it a better option for them? And are they gonna drink it? <laughs> All right, so for food, teaspoon trials of puree, I mean, that's just generally how people are gonna eat. Pureed consistencies is from a teaspoon. So you're looking for labial seal around the spoon. Are they able to close their mouth around it and then remove the consistency from the spoon? 
you're looking at manipulation of the bolus. So are they forming it into the round ball that is required for swallowing? Are they able to move it posteriorly to the back of their mouth? Um, you're looking at the swallow trigger. So generally you can see them actually trigger their swallow. Are they like pumping to try and get that swallow down? Um, or is it a one fluid motion? Um, so again, you're looking for signs and symptoms of aspiration. So coughing, um, the wet vocal quality, gurgling. Um, is there any oral residue following the swallow? Are they holding the presentation in their oral cavity or in their cheeks? and why, you know, like, are they just not really aware that they're eating or are, is it because they're having weakness and they aren't feeling it because of decreased sensation as well? If they're managing the purees without any difficulties, then we wanna move on to uh, mechanical soft. If they are unable to effectively and efficiently orally manage puree trials, and or significant aspiration is observed, then you don't wanna move on to the next consistency. All right, so mechanical soft, mixed consistencies, and regular swallows. We're going to talk a little bit about the differences between those three consistencies um, in regards to solid foods. The only difference that I consider between mechanical soft and regular solids is the um, consistency of the meat. So a mechanical soft is going to be the meats are cut up or minced, um, and then all of your like vegetables and fruits are going to be soft, essentially like steamed. Um, vegetables that are snappy, um, like carrots, uncooked carrots, apples, things that are really crunchy and crispy um, are considered a regular consistency, lettuce, things like that. Um, so some mechanical soft foods include crackers, cookies, soft fruits like bananas, cooked vegetables, and then the minced or chopped meats. A mixed consistency is a consistency that has both liquids and solids in it. So chicken noodle soup, a vegetable soup, um, cereals, dry cereals with milk, um, fruit cocktails, um, things like that. And then your regulars are your uncut meats, uncooked vegetables, um, and raw fruits. So when you're trialing solids, you want to look for the rate of intake and the portion size. Is it within normal limits or are they just shoveling it in because they don't have any impulse control? Um, are they able to bite off the presentation? Um, and is it because if they do have difficulty biting it off, is it because they don't have teeth and that's kind of normal for them? Or is it because they've got such significant weakness that they're not able to bite off a piece of the food? You're looking at the chewing of the food um, and kind of the same things that you were looking at with the puree. Are they forming a cohesive bolus? Are they able to move it back, swallow it down without any difficulties? Um, is there any residue following the swallow and why? And then when you're looking at what to initiate a diet um, or which diet to initiate, you wanna look at what they can tolerate over another. So whatever consistency they can tolerate without your intervention is the diet that you're gonna want to place them on. Because um, you wanna be able to walk out of the room that they're in and they can eat without any concern of them choking or aspirating. Okay, so let's talk about treatment um, of each phase. So for the oral phase, Modification of the consistency. If the patient is having difficulty chewing the solids or any aspect of the oral phase of the swallow, then this is um, that consistency that they're having trouble with is what you're gonna target in your therapy session. So if their biggest issue is thin liquids um, because they're aspirating on the thin liquids, they're not aspirating on nectar or honey, and then they're having trouble um, managing solid, regular solids, that's your treatment target in therapy is the regular solids and the thin liquids. Um, so you're giving them essentially one step up from their current diet during therapy trials. Um, and then again, ideally, um, your goals for every patient is for them to be able to tolerate whatever they were eating and drinking before their stroke or whatever other condition you may be treating them for um, without 
intervention, so without the need of a therapist or even without the use of compensatory strategies, because a lot of times patients like aren't going to use them. You know, if you come to me when I'm 87 and tell me, okay, now I have to start alternating my food and my drink every other bite, that's going to take one, some time for me to change the way I've been eating after I've established a way for so many years. Two, you know, like it just may not be conducive for how I eat. Um, you know, so ideally we'd like for each patient to be able to eat and drink without any type of intervention. But if that's not going to happen, then they need to be able to eat with some type of intervention. Um, a big thing to consider when you're doing your treatment um, and establishing goals is quality of life. Um, that's really important. Um, you know, we wanna be able to eat and drink whatever we want. Um, you know, and sometimes people are what we call functional aspirators where they will aspirate food and drink all day long, but their bodies just handle it. And, um, we're not affected by it, you know? So you do wanna kind of think about that too. If you've got a pretty frail, sick person, you know, then they're probably not gonna be able to handle aspirating. Um, and certainly a modification of a diet might be appropriate, but if they're aspirating everything and they don't have any history of getting pneumonia or having any type of respiratory infections, then do we really wanna modify their diet if they're not gonna eat it? Um, so just some things to consider. Um, so some strategies to increase oral efficiency, um, alternating the food and drink, that'll help clear the residue so you don't get a lot of buildup on one side or the other. Um, you can cue the patient to do a tongue sweep or a finger sweep to move the food out of their cheek pocket if um, there's residue in there. Um, Having them use their tongue is a good exercise because you're, you know, increasing uh, range of motion and coordination of the tongue. A lot of times I'll use a mirror with my patients just so that they have that visual feedback so they can see, oh, there's food coming out of my mouth and it's sitting on my chin and I didn't feel that. I need to take my napkin and wipe it or use my tongue and sweep it out of the way. Um, if they don't have that sensation, they're not going to know that it's there. So that visual feedback is good. Um, sometimes holding a patient's cheek on the affected side. So if I'm pocketing on my right side, I'm going to hold my cheek to prevent the food from hanging out on that right side. Um, for patients that sometimes will have that anterior substance loss, um, I actually had a patient that I worked with just a few weeks ago that had a lot of um, nasal regurgitation. So liquids were just pouring out of his nose while he was drinking it because his soft palate wasn't moving upward. And I was having him kind of raise his head up a little bit, and that significantly reduced the nasal regurgitation. Um, but that can also be tricky because if you're tilting your head back, especially with liquids, you've got the risk of premature spillage. You know, so food or drink is going to fall back into the airway before it's actually been triggered, and then you don't have that succession of events to protect your airway. So you've got to really make sure that you're doing that with the appropriate patient. All right, so some strategies to help increase airway protection and decrease the risk for aspiration and effort for swallow. This is probably the one that I personally use the most. Um, it's good for just rehabilitating those muscles. So um, a lot of times my patients, I'll tell them just swallow, swallow, swallow all day long, you know, take a little sip of drink if you need it and swallow, manage your secretions, your saliva and swallow those. Um, because the more you are using those muscles, the more likely they are to get better faster. Um, your throat muscles are just like any other muscle in your body. You don't use them, you lose them. You know, so if you're, you have a patient that's NPO and they're not swallowing except for the 30 minutes that you're treating them, how effective is your therapy gonna be? You know, so that's another reason to kind of push the Fraser free water protocol with your patients. Um, all right. So a chin tuck, um, that's where you place your chin down to your chest and then trigger your swallow. Um, it kind of creates less space in your pharynx to help pull the bolus downward. Um, you can have your patient turn their head towards the affected or weaker side to encourage the bolus to go down on the stronger side. So if I'm weak on my right side, I'm gonna turn my head to my right 
to encourage the food to go down on the left side um, to hopefully prevent aspiration. Um, and then obviously uh, alternating solids and liquids to clear any pharyngeal residue that might be hanging out. Um, you know, again, with thickened liquids, they tend to create more residue because of the viscosity or the thickness of the liquid. And if you've got weakness here, it's not gonna strip the liquids down as effectively. Um, so sometimes you'll have residue and then patients will aspirate that residue. Um, so again, just something to kind of consider when you're establishing a, a diet and a treatment plan for the patient. All right, so some good oral motor exercises. Again, drinking thick and liquids from a straw um, helps increase labial seal and buccal strength um, due to the resistance that thick and liquids create. Alternating a pucker and a smile. So having them um, alternate that and doing that, you know, three times, um, 10 times each. Um, especially with the mirror, that can help increase sensation, but also increase symmetry. Moving the tongue back and forth in their cheeks, um, it's good for helping with weak tongue strength and to increase sensation for removing residue. Um, it can also be done using like a tongue depressor or like a little um, mouth swab to create resistance. You know, again, you don't go to the gym and just move your arms hoping that you're gonna build muscle. You need to have resistance if you wanna build muscle in your arms. So same kind of theory goes with your swallowing muscles. Um, puffing out your cheeks while the therapist presses inward helps increase labial seal. Um, you know, so having that patient really hold on to and closing their mouth good to um, prevent uh, anterior substance loss. Pharyngeal exercises, so again, the effortful swallow, um, my biggest go-to exercise that I use um, in conjunction with or without resistance. So sometimes providing patients with thicker liquids creates that resistance that you are trying to target with the pharyngeal exercises. Um, the shaker exercise, so this is where the patient um, is lying on their back um, and there's two different ways that you can implement this exercise. One, don't ever lay somebody flat on their back that has a feeding tube because they are at just as high of a risk of aspirating um, stomach contents um, as you are with potentially being on a diet. So there are risks um, being on a peg tube, but if you've got somebody on a feeding tube, turn the feeding tube off before you lay them flat on their back. Um, so the shaker exercise, they're laying on their back and they're literally just lifting their head, looking at their toes, bringing their head down. Again, your head is heavy, you're creating resistance in your throat. They can either lift and hold for 60 seconds and do three sets of that, or they can just lift and rest 10 times three sets of 10. Um, I use that one a lot. That one does have um, some good um, outcomes, if you will. Um, neck stretches and exercises. So having the patient bring their ear to their um, shoulders, bringing it down and back down and side to side. Um, good for range of motion, especially if you've got somebody with contractures in their neck, so they're very, very stiff to one side. Some gentle stretching and moving of the neck can be beneficial for these patients. Um, a chin tuck with resistance, so I'll place um, like a pillowcase or a towel under their chin in like a U shape and I'll have them bring their chin down while I kind of hold a little bit of resistance because that can create um, a good exercise for them as well. Okay, um, so these resources here um, are just different exercises um, that you can access. Um, I don't know if you guys have access to podcasts, um, but Swallow Your Pride is a really good um, podcast that I listen to that has some really great um, therapeutic approaches. So if you have the opportunity to do that um, or to listen to that, I highly recommend it. Um, she kind of touches on a lot of different subjects. So it's not just um, swallowing. Um, so if you do have interest in some other aspects of um, 
you know, aphasia or things like that. She does talk about that stuff. Um, and then here are my references. Um, and again, you know, patients with PEGS, um, PEGS are really ideal for short term. You know, there are times where patients are re gonna require a PEG long term. Um, you know, but if you have the, our role as a therapist is to provide patients with education um, and information and allowing them to make a decision for themselves. Um, we want them to make an educated decision for themselves um, with us supporting whatever it is they're deciding. So if I've got a patient that is either potentially going to be MPO and on a peg or they're going to have quality of life, but they're potentially going to aspirate everything and they know that, I'm going to support them to eat. Um, so just, you know, obviously you've got to take it case by case, um, but you want to take a holistic approach and, you know, really honor what the patient wants for themselves. Um, Cause I know if I'm 87 and I can't have a steak or, you know, an ice cream cone, I'm going to be upset. <laughs> so anyways, um, do you guys have any questions for me? Just take your phone off mute if you have any questions. And um, Regina had to run, so she says thank you very much. Okay. Um, and if you guys have questions and you think of them later, you can always email me and I will forward them on to Carrie and get you um, the questions that way. I do not have any questions. Thank you. It was very easy <laughs> to understand. Oh, good, good, okay. That's great feedback. All right, well, thank you so much, Carrie, for joining us. We really appreciate this. I will um, have this recording on the OER webpage so that it can be viewed by the people who wanted to come but couldn't be here today, so. All right, well, thanks for having me. I enjoyed it. Thank you. All right, bye. Thank you. bye. You're welcome, bye.